Um, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to Bernie, Aubrey de Grey, and the others, uh, all of you that organized the conference. Um, already had a lot of interesting conversations, uh, a lot comes of these meetings, and those joining us online, uh, welcome. Uh, I, I, I'll be uh, giving some information uh, that comes from a company called Ajax Therapeutics. It's a public company, and so I need to remind all of you to, that I'll be making certain forward-looking statements that have risks and uncertainties, so I refer you to our filings with the SEC for more detailed information about the company. All right, so um, I feel the need to mention uh, the demographics of aging just very briefly in one important context. Yes, we're all in this curve, and yes, the baby boomers are growing old, but the important point I wanted to make is, is that, as you already heard, uh, aging is really characterized by a problem of chronic degenerative disease. Chronic disease that impacts a patient for years and years is uh, estimated to account for some 80% of all healthcare costs in the United States, and of course now is rapidly uh, rising. And the uh, economic challenge that poses for the United States, Japan, and many other countries around the world is it's a tsunami. It's a, a disaster in the making. Uh, it's been estimated that upwards, the net present value of amounts owed to the aging population in the U.S. Uh, for entitlement programs, most of which going to healthcare, is $200 trillion. It's a lot of money. The technology I'm going to discuss today represents the work of a lot of people. Uh, I'm going to talk specifically the work being done in our company. Uh, and it's targeted to directly addressing the problem of chronic degenerative disease and aging. And as I'll mention, maybe an unexpected benefit from this research is it provides, a, I believe, a really important insight into cancer. And so let me try to defend those outrageous claims. Well, how could something play an important role in cancer and in aging? Well, there's this old idea of antagonistic pleiotropy. Some of you may have heard of it. Bottom line is, a theory proposed uh, many years ago was is that aging evolved in metazoans as a, it's called antagonistic pleiotropy. The concept is, is that genes or alleles or the expression of genes, you know, the pattern of gene expression uh, was selected for optimum survival early in life, but those same changes or alleles or genes or genes expression kind of a detrimental effect later in life. And it, it, evolution was really selecting for uh, fitness of reproduction, regardless of the consequence later in life. Now, a classic example, which I spent a lot of my life working on, um, was uh, relating to telomere biology and telomerase. So what we see is, is that very early after the egg is fertilized, cells start to branch out into, away from this immortal germline, which I'm showing you here in red, the lineage of cells that perpetuates the species forever. Somatic cell lineages, or body cell lineages, very quickly, within a couple weeks, I think, for the most part, repress telomerase expression throughout the soma. And so a clock starts ticking. You may have heard of the telomere clock. So every time a cell replicates without telomerase, uh, telomeres start shortening, like a burning fuse, leading to cellular aging and senescence. Um, as an example of how this is antagonistic pleiotropy at work, uh, here in this diagram, it's a bit busy, but on the left you can see the expression of telomerase, what we call the catalytic component of telomerase, TERT, telomerase reverse transcriptase. You can see the expression in ES and IPS cells. These are immortal pluripotent cells that uh, Bernie just mentioned. And then uh, I'm showing you here the lack of telomerase very early thereafter. What it, uh, it shows here is diverse EPs refers to embryonic progenitors that are branching out of the first cells of life, pluripotent cells. You can see they've already lost immortality. And then I'm showing you diverse other kinds of adult cells of all kinds, heart muscle, liver, and everything else. 
epithelial cells, but look at the expression re-emerging in cancer. So the thought of antagonistic pleiotropy is, in the case of telomerase, is the benefit of turning off telomerase early in life helped reduce the risk of cancer, because cancer requires a lot of cell proliferation to evolve. Uh, but the, uh, the downside, of course, is cellular aging. But cancers need to turn telomerase back on. And this is interesting. You've heard that there's lots of types of cancer. There's no cure for cancer because there's kidney cancer and there's liver cancer. Look, there are pan-cancer phenomenon at work. Telomerase is one. Some of you may point out, well, there's some cancer cells you're showing me, Mike, here that have no telomerase expression on your graph. Yeah, but those are using an alternative mechanism to main telomeres called ALT. And um, th essentially, all cancers except a couple uh, had escaped this restriction, this somatic restriction of telomerase expression. OK, that's the telomeres. What's that got to do with the regeneration? Well, so back in, uh, Bernie mentioned the early work that was done some 20 years ago on reprogramming by nuclear transfer. Uh, it eventually became to be recognized that there are genes that are the, the tools that the egg cell uses to reprogram uh, a fibroblast back to the beginning of life. And the common ones, some of the common ones I've listed here, uh, SOX2, LIN28, MYC, OCT4, Nanog, there's others. You can pick and choose depending on the cell type. Uh, but uh, we did a study back uh, 2010 showing that you could uh, repro when you reprogram cells back to pluripotency, even aged cells, uh, you, restore, you can restore telomere length back to the beginning of life and reset the telomere clock. OK. Now I want to bridge to this idea of partial reprogramming. Um, as Dr. Uh, Eber Katz just presented, uh, there, there's a, a lot of um, interest in the uh, scientific community in regeneration. And there are some animals that are developmentally arrested early in life, um, maintaining a regenerative state that's really profound. And one example I'm showing you here in this picture is the Mexican salamander, the axolotls. Uh, for instance, you can amputate an arm or a wrist or a finger or whatever, and it nearly flawlessly grows back because these animals have developmentally arrested. Their clock of development is arrested very early in development. So what, how does that repression of regeneration work? As someone once said, could we make a salamander man? Could we make humans do this? If the mechanisms of regeneration are uh, in existence early in life and are turned off, can we restore what we once had? Humans, early in our development, we have a profound regenerative potential in our bodies. Could we find a way of unlocking it? And so you can see where I'm headed. The idea then bridge to could we use these reprogramming factors to take cells back to a regenerative state. So this has been called partial reprogramming by some. Uh, I prefer uh, the term induced tissue regeneration, or ITR, because I think the, to make a real product out of this, we need to find a way of precisely understanding and controlling this reprogramming to induce regeneration, but not to take cells back to pluripotency. And so I'm going to describe for you, just in a few minutes, a very simple concept of developmentally regulated ITR, a precise means of regulating reprogramming to take cells in the human body back in developmental time to this regenerative state. I want to tell you about how we've been thinking we could do that. What would that state look like? Well, let's start with skin. Uh, in the case of multiple animals, rats, mice, humans even, um, marsupials, where the animals enter the pouch, uh, still in an embryonic state um, where you can see regeneration. 
uh, scientists have carefully mapped when scarlet's regeneration gets turned off. And in the rat, you can see here's paper I've highlighted, it's around embryonic day 18. And so here you can see different animals um, comparatively where in their developmental time this is occurring. In humans, it's around um, uh, 60 days, two, two months of developmental time. That's the embryonic fetal transition, EFT. What's significant about it is if you think two seconds about it, it makes perfect sense. That was a, a point in development where anatomists recognized that organogenesis is essentially complete. The human is, you, you built the human body in a miniature form. If nature turned off regeneration and at but that time point, it makes sense if it's antagonistic pleiotropy. The human body is basically formed, it needs to grow, but organogenesis is complete. You don't really need to repeat the process. If it helped prevent cancer, let's turn that ability off, okay? Kind of makes sense. So I'm bridging here from the animal data to human data, uh, the embryonic fetal transition. Well, we did, and I don't have time to explain how we did this, but we did a very extensive, gosh, you know, like eight year um, research project within Ajax to really understand this transition. In brief, what we did is we took uh, hundreds of diverse types of uh, pre-EFT cells, cells that were still in this regenerative mode, human, of diverse kinds, and compared them with adult counterparts and fetal counterparts, and then did transcriptome, metabolome, um, you know, epigenetics, chip seek, all kinds of analyses to try to really understand this transition, the molecular bio biology behind it, and um, interestingly, it's consistent with the two previous speakers um, uh, in that regard, a role for lamins, uh, A and, and B, and, uh, in this process, and um, a, uh, the transition from the glycolysis to uh, uh, oxidative phosphorylation as well. Now here's an example of the transition You've heard, uh, as I mentioned, you heard of the, uh, uh, the Warburg effect. Early in development, our bodies rely on uh, glucose, glycolysis, and then we shift to oxidative phosphorylation. Cancers tend to revert back, the Warburg effect, back to the embryonic mode. Well, here's an example of a, a gene we think is important in this. It's called COX7A1. And uh, on the far left, you can see the expression of this gene in uh, pluripotent cells. It looks like there's a little bit of expression there, but that's background microradiator. And then at eight weeks, just as we're entering the transition to fetal development, uh, this is actually uh, all skin cells taken from the uh, upper arm of fetuses and adults of different ages. You can see the expression of this gene turn on and then maximize as you reach adulthood. This is just a marker. Well, it's probably more than a marker, right? So how could we precisely re regulate uh, uh, a reprogramming of cells back to a regenerative state just before the embryonic fetal transition? Well, I just showed you a gene whose promoter is relatively well characterized. And so we're developing this as we call developmentally regulated ITR, which is par uh, more sophisticated, we think, version of partial reprogramming where the promoter of COX7A1 drives reprogramming factors, in this case, uh, KLF4, OCT4, and LIN28, uh, which we have uh, determined to be optimum for inducing a regenerative state in skin. So I think you can see how this works. Uh, these vectors would uh, inst instill a reprogramming pattern of a gene expression until COX7A1 is turned off, and then the reprogramming factors are turned off. As an example, um, uh, in addition to what has been described previously of uh, regenerating mouse, this is the African spiny mouse. 
acomies, and here you can see um, the expression of one of these genes, LIN28, uh, B in acomies versus normal mice. As an example, this is a really profoundly regenerating mouse, right? Uh, amazing. Another way that you can uh, more precisely regulate uh, the induction of regeneration is just what we call segmental programming, reprogramming, using defined genes. And here is a hair regeneration uh, study done with just the knockdown of COX7A1 and the uh, introduction of LIN28 and then the combination of the two. And you can see the profound effect on hair regeneration in these animals. Now, this is a timeline. This is from Alova et al.'s paper, An Aging Cell, on the timeline of reprogramming, partial reprogramming. And I put into this timeline the expression of COX7A1. You can see that its expression drops to embryonic levels within, within a week of the, uh, being exposed to reprogramming factors. The pluripotency is not seen for about three weeks, two, two to three weeks. And you can see here labeled TERT, telomerase is expressed as cells re-enter pluripotency. So to get the optimum effect in aging, we would like to have telomerase re-expressed and reprogram cells to a regenerative state. Simple animals that have immortal cells, that have telomerase, and profound regenerative potential don't show aging. They, there is no Gompertz curve in many of these animals. And so we would like to design a technology that introduced telomerase and regeneration. But that, based on the, the studies we've done and what I'm highlighting here, we believe will require a separate addition of telomerase. I don't believe you can partially reprogram cells and tissues uh, and induce a regenerative state and get telomerase unless you reverted the cells back to pluripotency, which has significant risks uh, in my mind. Now I want to shift really quickly to the flip side of the coin. You remember I told you about antagonistic pleiotropy, right? Probably aging is a, anti is a tumor suppressive mechanism. And I give you the example of telomerase. Telomerase is turned off in the soma and reappears in virtually all cancers. As evidence that this is a really important, the repression of telomerase probably had a lot of selective value in the history of life as a, uh, a means of allowing us to live as long as we do without free, uh, free of cancer, humans. M mice typically die in a couple years of cancer, right? All right, what about regeneration? What we've discovered is that, but like telomerase, upwards of 90% or, or more of cancer cells have reverted to a pre-EFT state. Oh my gosh, that wasn't known before. Tel when, when, telomer when it was recognized that telomerase uh, is an important marker of cancer, it uh, became a hallmark of cancer. It's one of those segments in the wheel, you know, along with oncogenes. There's been this sense that cancer is kind of embryonic, uh, the Warburg effect, right? I just mentioned. Um, oncofetal antigens are sometimes used in diagnostic uh, uh, in diagnostics. Um, here's just an example. Here is LIN28 again in uh, pluripotent cells. You can see some of these pre-EFT embryonic progenitors, EPs there, have a little bit of LIN28. It's essentially off in all adult cells that we could ever see and reappearing in a lot of cancers. Not all, but many. I think you can see, yeah, a lot of cancer cells are reverted uh, back to a, a pre-EFT state. Here's a couple other uh, genes. I want to introduce you to the CPT1B. This is carnitine palmitotransferase 1B. It's a good marker of cells that have re reverted back to glycolysis. And you can see um, on the graph on the right that uh, 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 pluripotent stem cells express this gene as do these pre-EFT embryonic progenitors that are in the regenerative mode. But fetal cells, FC labeled there, adult non-epithelial as well as adult epithelial cells uh, express very low or no, uh, uh, none of this gene. 
whereas cancers, sarcomas, and carcinomas re-express it as an example of this Warburg effect. There's other interesting markers we found that are characteristic of the regenerative state on this volcano plot here. Uh, on the left, you can see all these PCDH genes. What are those? Those are the clustered proto-cadherins. So early on, it was recognized that in, in early embryonic development and in regeneration, this goes back many years, there must be a, a way that cells can recognize each other. Cell adhesion must play a fundamental role in regeneration. And so um, what we've discovered is, is that the, these genes, which in the adult are only expressed in the brain for a different reason than regeneration, uh, are expressed uh, not expressed in adult, are abundantly expressed in embryonic development and abundantly expressed again in cancer. So the way to think about these genes very simplistically is imagine if we, you know Velcro, imagine we had hundreds of thousands of different kinds of pairs of Velcro. So only, you know, Velcro one, the two would stick together, and the Velcro too, only those kinds would stick together. Then we could take a jet airplane, take it all apart, and put all those Velcros in the right place, put the pieces of the jet airplane in a big box and shake it, and out would fly a jet. I mean, okay, overly simplified. You get the idea, though. Um, these genes be, appear to be playing a role in allowing uh, the amputated limb of a salamander, for instance, to recognize each of the, the cells that belong together and reorganize themselves, even despite tremendous trauma. And um, if you look at those and a bunch of these other embryonic markers here in sarcomas and carcinomas, they're a hallmark of cancer. I mean, they're abundantly re-expressed in cancer. 100% uh, of carcinomas that we've studied um, re-expressing these embryo uh, pre-EFT. Now, it's important to point out, I'm not talking about pluripotency markers. I'm talking about pre-EFT markers. We, if we looked at OCT4 or MANOG or any of these pluripotency genes, rarely they're in cancer. I think out of 1,000 cell lines we looked at, we found like two that had OCT4. All right, so this, allow, this opens the door to some novel therapeutic and diagnostic strategies. I don't really have time to go into detail, but we, we're designing vectors that utilize the unique uh, cell adhesion molecules re-expressed in cancer cells that are not in the adult from uh, certain of the uh, cluster protocadherin genes and using a, a promoter that's embryonic specific like CPT1B to drive toxic gene products. So to target these vectors to cancer and then selectively destroy the cancer cells. And what's exciting about it is it's potentially a pan-cancer therapeutic strategy. Here I'm just showing some data. The antibodies alone to the embryonic clustered protocadherins can recognize uh, cancer cells and statistically significantly um, uh, kill them. As a, and not touch normal cells. Diagnostics. This was a study, not ours, and a published study looking for pan-cancer markers, gene expression markers. And I've highlighted in uh, yellow here the genes that are underexpressed in, um, in cancers, multiple cancers. This is a meta-study, you know. Isn't it interesting that the ones that are, are, are underexpressed in cancer are uh, adult specific markers that we discovered as part of this EFT study? Wow. Here is an example of uh, how you can see this in methylated DNA. The, the advantage of this modification of DNA, methylated DNA, is it's durable. So fragments of DNA from a tumor can go into the circulation, and you can do what's called liquid biopsy. You can actually find little 
little snippets, little nucleosomes of DNA and by PCR uh, find them and detect them. And here you can see that uh, the top four are embryonic pre-EFT cells. They're in this regenerative mode. And at the bottom you can see adult counterparts that are adult. And you can see they're undermethylated in adult. And, uh, but then at the, at the bottom you can see these little tick marks. Uh, they're re-expressed again in uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, and so on. Pan cancer, these are pan cancer uh, differentially methylated regions, DMRs. So we're really excited about this. Now I'll make one last point. What I've told you so far probably won't come as a surprise. Uh, a lot of it's um, been hinted at and as where the field's going. Um, I, I described how we think of regeneration and cancer as, you know, two sides of the same coin. Uh, I mentioned why we think these regeneration genes are turned off to help prevent cancer, just like telomerase being turned off. Re-expressing them could play a fundamental role in inducing regeneration, reprogramming, reversing the aged phenotype of cells. You get all that. This might come as a surprise, what I'm going to tell you next. It was a surprise to us. All right. The, there's a thing that people have been talking about for years called cancer stem cells. You guys have heard of this, right? I first heard of cancer stem cells back in the stem cell days when all this news was breaking about embryonic stem cells and so on. And I thought, well, everyone wants to get in the game, right? Now there's cancer stem cells. Well, as best I can piece together, is what happened was people recognized that uh, when you have a breast cancer or a lung cancer or whatever, you use, you use radio or chemotherapy to treat it, there are resistant cells that are not destroyed by the chemo or radiotherapy. And this reminded, I think, some researchers of, well, you know, stem cells are relatively resistant to chemo and radiotherapies. The reason is they, re they rarely divide. Bone marrow stem cells sit there in that niche in the bone marrow and uh, maybe divide once a year. So and these agents kill dividing cells. That's how cancer cells are selectively destroyed by alkylating agents and so on. So they thought, oh, these resistant cells are cancer stem cells. Then the idea was, ah, maybe they express pluripotency markers. But then the field got confused because people started talking about uh, what's called the epithelial mesenchymal transformation. And this middle, uh, this diagram, you can see I'm showing you an epithelial carcinoma, these epithelial cells multiplying, making a small tumor and evolving. And then they do this transition where they become like a fibroblast. They start crawling around and metastasizing through the body. And when people were studying the epithelial mesenchymal transformation, people started saying, ah, oh, you know what? But those are the stem cells. And so the field's rather confused right now. But the thought was, and maybe still is, that the cancer stem cell, the mesenchymal cell, the one that's resistant to chemotherapy, is more primitive. Uh, many people even say they express OCT4 and you know, pluripotency markers, it's a more primitive cell, right? It's a stem cell. What I'm suggesting is it's absolutely backwards. So I don't have a, a time here today to, to show you all the data, but uh, what we see is using these markers of the embryonic fetal transition is that the uh, cancer stem cell, the resistant cell, is a cancer cell that has reverted back to an adult non-regenerative state. It's absolutely backwards. So um, the cancer stem cell has lamin A, an adult-like cell. The uh, uh, embryonic version of the cancer cells have lamin B1 and have a relative lack of lamin A. Uh, so it's a, it it's a, provides a whole new insight, I think, into potentially addressing this nasty problem we have of understanding these resistant cells and how to specifically target them. Because in the case of many cancers, we can 
debulk a lot of the tumor, uh, but these uh, resistant cells um, have been relatively resistant. So I, I scratched out cancer stem cell. Uh, they're adult-like cancer cells. Someone will come up with a more clever name than me, I'm sure. We at Ajax, I won't bore you with the clinical development, but uh, we have uh, three products in development, uh, brown adipocytes made from pluripotent cells for the treatment of diabetes. Uh, Renalon is the application of reprogramming to induce scarless wound repair using uh, developmentally regulated ITR, which I sort of introduced you to. Uh, EPRO is a cancer therapeutic strategy based on some of the things I told you. And then there's the uh, di cancer diagnostic ap uh, aspects of this, which we plan to partner out. So in summary, I mean, we've seen some revolutions in biotech um, that had a lot of impact. Recombinant DNA started the industry. Monoclonal antibodies have made, have been a platform allowing us to make, uh, target many different antigens with a lot of clever strategies, a lot of immunotherapies. Regenerative medicine, um, since this conference started, Bernie, some years ago, has made significant strides. Um, as you can see, some of the deals that have been done here. Um, my previous company, Biotime Now Lineage, recently announced a nearly $700 million deal just for RPE cells for the treatment of, of ocular disease. This example, this is a platform because you can make hundreds of different cell types for many different therapeutic applications, and we'll see that in the future. I would call that the regenerative medicine 1.0 because 2.0 is now being born and uh, the ability to induce um, a regenerative state uh, in a context of age-related degenerative disease, which as I mentioned is 80% of our healthcare costs, straining the economics of the United States, causing untold suffering uh, to our population and our friends and our loved ones. Uh, is uh, where the field is headed. And um, so with that, I'll just summarize and say that there's a lot of therapeutic and diagnostic strategies coming out of, we'll call it partial reprogramming research. Um, the, the work that's done uh, in, in the past uh, by uh, Dr. Heber Katz and others working on axolotls and um, planaria and all of this. Um, goes back now over 100 years, uh, has led to uh, improvement, improving uh, understanding of how we can induce uh, tissue regeneration. Uh, and uh, what's so exciting about this is like telomerase and telomeres, uh, a technology that originally started out as a way of treating aging is, has uh, surprising and important applications in cancer uh, as well. With that, I'll thank you very much.